Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Society of Washington University's February lecture. I'm Angie Bernardi. Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes. To put it really close. Okay. Thanks for taking the time to join us today in person and on live stream to hear one of our favorite lecturers, Dr. Timothy Everline. Though I know many of you are already members of Women's Society, I want to be sure to give a special welcome to all of our guests joining us today. I take every opportunity I can to invite others to consider becoming a member of Women's Society. Membership allows you to enjoy opportunities together throughout the year, sometimes for social events, and often for our lecture series like today, which features some of our most prominent and esteemed faculty and members of the Washington University community. The Women's Society is an organization that was created to bring the community to the university and the university to the community. We're a group of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds who support scholarships, university programs, and lectures for the benefit of the university and the St. Louis community. We're proud partners in supporting students and bringing to life Chancellor Martin's vision for Washington University to be in and for St. Louis. If you're not already a member, or need to renew, I want to let you know that this QR code does work. There was a little discussion, so you can um, join us or go to our website. We also oversee the Bear Necessity Shop, which our manager is here with us today. It's located in the Umrath House, and the shop, which you can visit in person or online, features unique WashU logo items and clothing that cannot be found anywhere else on campus supplies, and also is the exclusive seller of graduation flowers and gifts. All proceeds support our Elizabeth Gray Danforth Scholars, so please remember to shop there next time you need to wash you merchandise. This has already been a very exciting year for the Women's Society, and we look forward to much more to come. Please plan to join us for our spring social on March 7th and our next lecture at the Kemper Art Museum. Now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Aixa Martinez, Chair of the Education Committee. I'm grateful for her leadership and for the committee for their hard work in putting together this fantastic lineup of lectures, and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Angie. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. I am Aixa Martinez, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Timothy Everline. Dr. Everline is the founding director of the Seidman Cancer Center. He also serves as the Olin Distinguished Professor and Senior Associate Dean for Cancer Programs at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University Medical Center. He recently stepped down from his role as the Bixby Professor and Chair of the Department of Surgery at Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, and Surgeon in Chief of, at Barnes Jewish Hospital, where he served for over 24 years. Dr. Everline earned his MD from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He completed his surgical training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, including an appointment as Chief Resident. He also completed research and clinical fellowships at the National Cancer Institute. Prior to joining Washington University in January of 1998, Dr. Everline was the Richard E. Wilson Professor of Surgery at Harvard University Medical School and Chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Everline has participated on numerous national committees, medical advisory boards, including several for the National Cancer Institute, and editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement, Advancement of Science, and a past chair of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Board, which develops guidelines for all cancer care throughout the United States. Dr. Everline has received numerous awards, including the 2019 Citizen of the Year Award from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch for significant contributions to the St. Louis region. 
Washington University is fortunate to benefit from his insight and expertise, and we are grateful to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eberlein. Well, thank you very, very much. That was, that was a great introduction. My mother, I'm sure, is very proud. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I just want to begin by thanking all of you for what you do. Because I will tell you, I wouldn't be here today standing in front of you if it hadn't been for a full scholarship. Mm. Yay. So, so, I mean, you know, I, I received the last, very last, full ride scholarship to the University of Pittsburgh. And, and my family would never have been able to send me to medical school or even graduate from undergraduate school. So, uh, so what you're doing is providing uh, future leaders an opportunity and they'll benefit from it. And as you know from many of the past recipients, they'll uh, come back and be, you'll be very, very proud of what they've accomplished. So today what I wanted to do is give an update about Simon Cancer Center. So this year, uh, we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary. And uh, we sort of artificially started the time clock when Al Seitman named the Cancer Center. It seemed as arbitrary as any to start our birthing, as it were. But as you'll see in a moment, we actually started about 18 months before that in preparation, putting the groundwork, developing research programs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is the trajectory in 25 years. <clears throat> and you can see, uh, we actually began in 1998, February of 1998, planning for having a comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Washington University had always been criticized because it had fabulous science and fabulous medical physicians, etc. but it did not have a cancer center. And so in February of 98, we began that process. We had a funded strategic plan in September of 98. And in November of 1999, Al Seidman named the center. Now, people frequently say, well, why did that happen? And it was very altruistic, if any of you know Al. Um, he had a very close friend who had a brain tumor, and his friend went to MD Anderson. And Al asked a very simple question. Well, gee, why should his friends and business associates go to Houston or Rochester, Minnesota, or New York, or Boston, or someplace? Why couldn't they get world-class cancer care here in St. Louis? Better, his question, was why couldn't people from Houston and Rochester, Minnesota, and New York, and Boston come here? for their world-class cancer center. Well, now they do. The Seidman this year will care for 75,000 unique patients, and they'll come from all 50 states. So I think we've sort of fulfilled Al's, uh, his vision. In 2001, we became a designated cancer center, and in 2004, comprehensive. And I'll, I used to think comprehensive means you take care of all kinds of cancer, right? But it is. The National Cancer Institute has a very specific definition of what a comprehensive cancer center is. And that is, do, do you take advantage of all the assets of your entire institution and focus them on cancer. 
So when we birthed the birth center, birth. We, we did a couple of things. One is we decided we wanted to be experts in everything. Tall order back in 1998. And the other thing is that we wanted patients to have a unique experience. Barnes Jewish Hospital was well known for care of patients, but we wanted patients to have a unique experience. One that they would tell their family and friends was truly supportive and provided them as much care and support as possible. And so over the years, uh, we grew, we developed a network of uh, cancer related programs to work with us. We created satellites. In 2018, we uh, developed a bed tower that all of you see inpatient facility. And uh, I'll talk to you in, in a moment about the ambulatory cancer building and uh, a vertical expansion of research space which is in mid-campus and will be used to expand our GMP facility for cell therapies. So again, more investments. Now, this is a snapshot. I'm gonna give a quiz at the end, so <laughs> you should take notes. Uh, this is a snapshot of Sighton Cancer Center. 283 members. And we have a little over 60, almost $61 million in direct research support from the National Cancer Institute. And that puts us well in the top seven or eight of all cancer centers in the United States. Uh, we have about a little shy of uh, $200 million of research support for the cancer center, which again puts us, you know, in the maybe not top five, but the top of the next five. Just as important though, is the number of uh, patients that we put on clinical trials. That was also one of the things that we wanted to emphasize. How could we put patients on clinical trials? If you think about it, we'd be doing radical operations. We wouldn't have any chemotherapy. We wouldn't have any endocrine therapy. We wouldn't have any immunotherapies if it weren't for clinical trials. <coughs> Each of those advances came about because of a clinical trial. And it's an opportunity for me to again, thank our patients. I've always said, Patients are the most altruistic individuals on earth. And why? Because we ask them to participate in a clinical trial that may not benefit them, but may benefit the next patient that comes through the door. I think that's the definition of altruism. Okay. Uh, and so we keep track of the patients we put on trials very closely, and we monitor to make sure that we provide benefits to all the patients in our community. So over 31% are minority accruals. We look at rural participation, 9.5%. And 23% are underserved, okay? They lack access to medical facilities, et cetera, except through us. 75% of those are what's called investigator-initiated trials. That means we initiate the trials. They're unique to site the cancer center. And I'm going to give you a few examples a little bit later on. So, um, and these rank among the highest in the entire United States. So, a lot of work goes into this. Here's our funding history. So, 
I, I gave a talk to uh, a bunch of Edward Jones people, and I said, geez, you think about this, 25 years, we've had a 500% increase. It's compounded 20 some percent per year. If we get another alternative, you know, job, you know, doing that. But this is, uh, we've had this in rapid increase in, in uh, funding. And two things have happened. One is we have a peer review process, multiple layers where we carefully invest. We were sort of like a venture capital fund in some ways. We take new ideas, new directions, challenges to the status quo, and we invest in them carefully. And what happens? Those become the treatments tomorrow. So I always say, you know, we're always thinking ahead, you know, we don't rely on what worked yesterday. We're always challenging. And the other thing we do really well, we put scientific teams together. And if you think about the ability to solve complex cancer problems, it takes a team. Individuals may be brilliant, but it takes a whole team. And that's true clinically, and it's true for science, scientifically. So, uh, here's our collaborative grants. So these are these are our team grants. You can see in 2019 we had 72. In 2023, December of 23, we had 157. We've already heard about two or three others that are. Increasing so 118 percent, so we're really good at taking advantage of our institution, taking experts from biomedical engineering and clinical medicine and different specialties, etc., putting them together and having them solve a cancer problem. We're really good at that. Now, I chose a couple of examples today because A, they're unique to Site and Cancer Center, but B, they sort of give you, I hope, a feel for the trajectory, what has happened in these 25 years. So back in 2003, Washington University School of Medicine did about 35% of mapping of the human genome. It was thought to be one of the major contributions in science. It took two decades and over a billion dollars to accomplish. A billion dollars, two decades to map the human genome. Five years later, Simon Cancer Center mapped the first cancer human genome. It took us about two years and it cost a little over one million dollars. And you say, okay, well, gee, that's really a scientific advance, but how many of us sort of have a million dollars in our pocket and say, okay, well, gee, can you? Look at my genome and tell me whether I have risk factors for cancer and other kinds of things. So we've developed this uh, uh, whole genome sequencing, but in a personalized type of uh, program. We started out with some of our heme malignancies, acute myelogenous leukemia and uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. What we do is do whole genome sequencing. So just like we did in 2008 that cost a million dollars. But now we can do that in less than 48 hours. And you know, it costs several hundred dollars. Okay? 
And what we're doing is personalizing, creating these panels for various types of cancer. It's all done here. What's the advantage of doing whole genome sequencing? Well, in acute myelogenous leukemia and MDS, we do a technique called cytogenetics. We look at the genes, et cetera, the most common genes that may be mutated. Turns out whole genome sequencing, we get about 20% more accurate information. That helps us to personalize how we put together combinations of chemotherapy for the benefit of the patient. So now we're creating these panels of genes to do whole genome sequencing, less than 48 hours, a couple hundred dollars. And that technology is all developed here. So that's one unique. Here's another. Building on our expertise of genomics and gene sequencing and other kinds of things, we ask the question, could we use that information to create a vaccine? Now, vaccines are really nice. Um, you know, those of you who have had COVID vaccines, you know, that will save, save your life. The same technology actually grew from the work that was done in cancer, trying to create a vaccine. There's two problems with vaccines in cancer, however. One, you have to figure out how to turn the immune system on. And two, you have to focus it only on the cancer. Wouldn't be very good if we wiped out your kidney cancer and killed both of your kidneys, right? So we had to figure out how to turn on the immune system and have it focus on the cancer. So we started on a cancer that is frequent in black women, triple negative breast cancer. It's a very interesting kind of cancer because triple negative breast cancer is really sensitive to chemotherapy the first time. But then it's almost completely resistant chemotherapy. And it makes it very difficult to treat. So we thought in that background, this would be an ideal population of patients to try a vaccine. Because the chemotherapy might work initially, shrink the tumor, get us to do a less radical operation, do radiation, Patient would do well, but the majority of these patients would recur within two years. So we did a trial. And we did whole genome sequencing. We looked at the genes that we thought would produce the most effective immune response. We now created a computer algorithm that is used worldwide. Everybody else uses the same algorithm. In the first 19 patients that we treated with triple negative breast cancer, only three women in six years have had recurrence out of the 19. So we decided yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. That, you know what I mean? that, was, that was just perfect. It was so effective that we decided, well, gee, we should try it in other kinds of cancer. So what's a cancer that's not usually thought of as being very responsive to treatment? Pancreatic cancer. You know, we've been trying to crack the nut of 
pancreatic cancer. And here, some of my colleagues in the Department of Surgery actually developed some immune therapies for pancreatic cancer that improved response rate to chemotherapy 40, 50% of patients from 4 to 5%, tenfold. But we thought, well, gee, maybe what we should do is add the vaccine. The original nine patients that we treat with this vaccine, and you know, every year we keep improving, altering, fixing, tweaking, et cetera, et cetera. The original nine patients, only three of those nine patients have had recurrence. This is now five years out. So again, we're making progress. Are we effective 100% of the time? No. Uh, so we still have to keep working at it, perfecting it, making it better, et cetera. But the beauty of this is these patients rarely have any side effects to the vaccine. That's what's really nice. And why? Because it only kills the cancer. It doesn't kill the normal cells. So, OK. Now, I have to give you a little background about this. <clears throat> this is, by the way, is a photoacoustic image of a rectum. Um, let me give you a background. When I was in Boston, I used to do all kinds of cancer surgeries. And if a patient came to me with a rectal cancer, we would usually do an operation. And as you'd imagine, you remove a rectal cancer from a patient in the rectum, it usually impairs their bowel activity. And in fact, in some of these patients, they had a permanent colostomy as a result. So we asked the question a number of years ago, well, could we figure out an alternative treatment? Okay, again, one of these bright ideas, well, how could we prove that? Well, biomedical engineering, there's a professor here named Li Hong Wong, who's now at Caltech. He and I became very good friends. Photoacoustic imaging is ultrasound and laser combined. You can almost get a histology, like under a microscope, view of tissue, and you can do it with a probe, and you can do it in real time. So we ask the question, if we change the way we do neoadjuvant chemotherapy, radiation, and rectal cancer, might those patients require less surgery? So over here is a responder, and you can see that there isn't much residual activity outside where you look over here, there's a lot of activity in the tissue outside the lumen of the intestine. We can now do this in real time after neoadjuvant therapy. Now 50% of these patients do not get any surgery, and they do just as well when they did get surgery. So we changed the paradigm for how we treat rectal cancer. And again, started here. It's now being duplicated in many places. And of course, we're treat, tweaking all this to say, well, how can we do it in 75 or 80% of patients? What do we need to change to make it more effective? Here's another example. One of the unique things that we did is we bring people together from many different backgrounds in our cancer center and get them to exchange information. And this next example is a perfect example of that. So uh, we really have focused on immune treatments for cancer. Science Magazine, two years ago, said we had 
one of the top five immunology programs in the world. And, and so it seemed to us that we should invest in that and figure out how we can tap into the immune system. I always said, if we took my kidney and engrafted it into any of you, your body would reject my kidney since we're not identical twins. And the way it would do that, it would turn on your immune system and it would destroy my kidney. Well, if it can destroy my kidney, why can't it destroy a cancer, right? Well, not quite so easy. <laughs> and so for the last 30 years, we've been trying to figure out, okay, well, what do we need to do to make the immune system react only against the cancer? So there's a cell in your immune system, we all have it, called an NK cell, a natural killer cell. It's actually very effective, like if you get exposed to an infection, the natural killer cell will activate and destroy the bacteria. And it'll cause creation of B cells, which bring antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. So we were asking the question, would natural killer cells, could we turn them on and get them to recognize human cancer? One of our investigators who does lymphoma research ran a trial, didn't see common themes here, right? Did a trial that was incredibly effective in patients with recurrent lymphoma. So we were in a conference like this, just on you know, Friday afternoon, and somebody said, geez, uh, do you think that that would work in childhood leukemia? Now, why did they ask that question? Childhood leukemia is one of the big success stories in cancer treatment. When I was a fellow at the National Cancer Institute, 90% of children with leukemia died their disease, 90%. Today, in 2024, 90% live happily ever after. Now that's pretty remarkable, right? Wouldn't you say? Yes. However, it's like triple negative breast cancer. When these children, the 10%, have recurrence, almost never responds to chemotherapy. So what do we do? Would NK cells work? So here's the data. 14 of the 15 patients we treated had complete responses. All their cancer went away, and they continued, these children, this is actually the first young boy who uh, received this therapy. You know, people thought, little oh boy, is this going to work? It worked beautifully. And we had children from all over the country coming to St. Louis Children's Hospital, Sightman Kids, to get this therapy. Now, other places have replicated our process. So, in case of for pediatric AML. <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> I know they want the hook to come out. <laughs> All right, now most of you, I'm sure, have heard about the burden of cancer. We have a catchment area of 82 counties. Basically, it's the eastern two-thirds of Missouri and the southern two-thirds of Illinois. That's our catchment. In that area, we have some of the most underserved cancer-challenged populations of patients in the entire United States. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you ranked all the counties in the United States of America by mortality due to cancer, four of the top six are in the food chain of Missouri. Four of the top six. 
If you look at the Mississippi Valley on both sides of the Mississippi River, Illinois, Missouri, it has the highest rate of colorectal cancer mortality anywhere in the United States of America. Can you okay. repeat that sentence? It's the highest rate of colorectal cancer mortality in any place in the United States of America. Okay, there's a lot of health challenge populations throughout the United States, right? But this has the highest degree of colorectal cancer mortality. And, and this chart just reminds me, if you look at black and white, we had some real challenges. Here's breast cancer, mortality for a black woman versus white woman. Same stage of disease, but twice as likely to die of a breast cancer. So 2.4 times likely with the male with prostate cancer, and so on and so forth. So 25 years ago, when we were birthing this cancer center, we created a program. At that time, it was unique in the NCI designated cancer. It was called the Program for the Elimination of Cancer Disparities, PCAD. Okay? This is a multi pronged program. It does education, it does outreach, it does screening, it does implementation science, it does navigation, et cetera. And what's the impact that that 25-year program has had on our population that surround St. Louis? Okay. Between, in the decade, 2010 to 18, we saw a 40% reduction. So women, African-American women, 24% of them had presented with stage four breast cancer spread to other parts of their body. And we reduced that to 14%. And that's still on its way down. Mortality, that's the real test. Okay, can we reduce mortality? It was 33% in the county, 31% in the city. And we took women with late stage disease, stage four, and made it equivalent to the national average. So these programs work very effectively. It takes a long time, and you have to be persistent. And my next, next example is an example of that. So you never can take your eye off the ball. You never can take your foot off the gas pedal. You always have to be observant. So here's the example. Now remember I said, here's the Mississippi River. You know, St. Louis goes down here, right? Both sides of the Mississippi Valley. Highest mortality. It was 31 counties. And using all these programs, what happened? We reduced these 31 counties to four. And we did that through very aggressive screening, education programs, follow up of patients, navigation, et cetera, et cetera. And may I remind you, some of these counties down here, some of the most health challenged in the entire United States. My previous example, I talked about North County and St. Louis City, black, urban, maybe blue. White, rural, red. What's that say to me? This isn't whether you're Democrat or Republican. Doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Doesn't matter whether you're red or blue. Doesn't matter whether you're urban or rural. 
Doesn't matter whether you're black or white. Do you have access to health care? And if you do, we can make a difference. Now I said, never can take your eye off the ball. Here's why. In that same period of time, seven new counties emerged. Okay? It's like putting smoke in a bottle. Every time you turn around, you have to keep working at it in order to make a difference in the entire population we treat. But we're able to do that. Okay, last example. I hope you all have been taking notes because we're going to have a quiz. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, last example. Most cancer centers have smoking cessation programs, but, but the standard paradigm is we train some person to do smoking cessation counseling. And it's sort of like genetic counselors, you know? They have to be specifically trained and they can only see a finite number of patients in a given period of time. And, you know, that can be effective, but it's only effective if you're the person that gets to see the counselor, you see? And we're treating, as I said, 75,000 unique patients. We wanted to make more of an impact. So we developed a new program the only place in the country that does it, where we basically train all of our frontline clinic staff how to screen patients and gave them the background about smoking cessation programs. As you can see, just our patients here, 45,000 patients, and in our rural community partners, 81,000 more in the first year of this program when we started. And it's like a pyramid, you know, you get 90% of the patients screened, uh, seven to 15, 18% smoke, which by the way, you know, in Missouri, we have the highest per capita cigarette smoking in the entire United States, correlating with the yeah, lowest cigarette tax, three cents. Duh. Could there be a relationship? <laughs> I'm not supposed to make this a political. <laughs> All right, so, uh, but this program is highly effective. So, you know, we routinely get somewhere between 25 and 30% of the patients who voluntarily participate to quit smoking which is about eight times higher than normal people who enter smoking cessation program. So it's a way to reduce tobacco. Now here's the last thing. I think any of you have driven down Forest Park Parkway. You see that beautiful brand new building. And I, I want you, you recognize something here in the answer, you know, yeah, I'm just done simple country surgeon, but, you know, the builders are saying, well, you know, you can't enclose the garage because otherwise all the carbon monoxide and fumes, et cetera, will go up through the building. Of course, that wouldn't be a good thing. So you have to have this air flow. So we created something. What's this look like? Any of you recognize that? If you see it in person, it's actually more impressive. It's a DNA helix. Oh, that's what. Oh, I know. That's what I Okay. It's a DNA helix. Same thing with our logo. But what's really neat about this building is we're going to consolidate all cancer and put it in the building, all the outpatient, all the infusion. All the infusion will have single rooms, they'll have places for the family, they'll have windows, so you can see daylight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'll have radiology support, so you can get a CT scan, PET CT, MR, et cetera, et cetera, in that building. You don't have to leave, go somewhere else. More importantly, we're changing the paradigm of how we 
scheduled patients. So we're cohabitating our specialists. So instead of you going to one specialist one day and another specialist another day and another specialist a different day, we're going to cohabitate people so that particularly the new patients will have more efficient care that will actually allow us to see more new patients more quickly. And, you know, there's a business center in there and there's the, you know, technical support of the building is pretty impressive for radiology, pathology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it, when you drive in, you're no more than 100 feet from the elevator. And if you can get to an elevator, you can go to any of your clinic places because you're going to probably be on the one floor. And so, again, um, as a healing garden, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to think about this from the patient's point of view. One of my pet peeves has been when we build buildings, and we build a lot of buildings, frequently as you get to the end of the project, it's hard to put nice artwork you know, because you're running out of money, budget, et cetera. Can we stay on track? In this building, we have all original artwork. And we've tried to color code the floor so that, you know, if you're going to a clinic, easily get there, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think it'll be a unique experience. And it will be finished, the builder will give us the keys in April. And it'll take a couple of months to optimize everything. In September, we'll probably start seeing patients there. So there's always, you know, we're always pushing. I was at an event and Dean Perlmutter said, you know, the thing that's unique about Washington University, we never rest on our laurels. And so I happened to speak after him and I said, David, you're absolutely correct because on the eastern face of the building, right over here, it'll be bridge connected to the next building for expansion across Taylor Avenue. That's already in the works. Okay, so that's what's happened. These are um, unique programs, unique to Site and Cancer Center. They have been paradigm shifts in cancer care throughout the United States. And I've had the privilege of presenting to you this wonderful maze of contribution. But trust me when I tell you, behind the scenes are literally thousands of people who are trying to make a difference every single day. So I always say, I have the best job in the world because every day I go to work, I witness a miracle. Things that we thought would be impossible, vaccines, NK cell therapy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't think they would work 10 years ago. They're now common practice. <coughs> and it's because of the passion and dedication of my colleagues. So I'm happy to take questions. I hope everybody's taking lots of notes. Okay. So. A couple of uh, sessions ago, we were exposed to artificial intelligence. Yep. We're, we're a little dangerous now. How was that used in, or I guess my question is, was that used in the ability to speed up the process of taking a specimen or real-time analysis of what you had regarding a cancer specimen? Yeah, so the question was artificial intelligence. How much has that played a role? Actually, it's played very little role in any of the examples that I gave. But 
it can play a role in many of the offshoots of Mrs. Jones. So let me give you an example. When we start screening patients, large numbers of patients, genomically, artificial intelligence, we, we can utilize that. When we want to screen patients to participate in clinical trials, you know, it's very difficult because the patient has to meet very strict eligibility criteria. There's only certain things that we can do, et cetera, et cetera. And when we have humans present that to patients, very difficult. Why? Because you can't keep, a, keep tabs of, of the Sutton Cancer Center has 500 and 50 active clinical trials. No human being would be able to keep track of all this. Your artificial intelligence could. So we could take a patient and in seconds say, well, ma'am, you are eligible for this, this, this trial, but your hematocrit has to be that, or your creatinine has to be this, or you can't have disease in this organ or that organ, et cetera, et cetera. You see what I mean? And that streamlines and makes it much more efficient. Same way we were working with some of our communications public health team, creating pictorial one page, here's what you can participate in a clinical trial. If you think about it, um, it'll make it a lot more understanding. How do you how do you explain to a patient randomization? That's a little threatening to a patient. Oh, we're going to flip a coin. You know what I mean? You get a bullet to the head or you get an empty chamber. You know, we're going to flip a coin. That's, you know, that there's some, you know, so we, we can explain that in a picture, in a series of pictures. And so we're testing that in clinical trials right now. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm curious about your thoughts, doctor, regarding some of the diagnostic testing out there, such as Grail, which I believe is a joint venture with Illumina. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so everybody know what Grail is? You know, Grail is a blood test. So, you know, I just draw blood from you, and I'll tell you whether you have cancer or not. And wh what are we doing behind the scenes? What we're doing is looking for abnormal cells and genes, et cetera, et cetera, that are present. So here's the problem. You know, in some patients and some diseases, yes, that can be beneficial. However, right now we don't have the technology to tell you, okay, well, you know, this abnormality equates to this cancer in you, the patient, individual patient. We can tell you you're at higher risk. And sure, you're correct. If you take a patient, for example, with a colon cancer uh, and you do a grow test, they're going to have more circulating tumor cells than a patient who doesn't. But in the patient who only has a few circulating tumor cells, what do you do when all their workup has been negative? So first off, it's not FDA approved, costs about $1,000, okay? But your insurance company, I will guarantee, will charge you for all of the tests that you do if your grill test comes back positive because they're not, because it's not FDA approved, you're gonna have to pay all that out of pocket. And so I always say, and, and by the way, we are, scientific advisors to Grail. <laughs> okay, so we know a lot about it. In fact, some of our investigators, Richard Cody is the world's expert in circulating tumor cells, et cetera. But it's not quite ready for prime time when applied to a big population. And it certainly isn't available to everybody, okay? You're right, if you can afford $1,000, you can go get your Grail test, and if it's positive, you can pay out of pocket for the various CT scans and MR scans, et cetera, et cetera, trying to hunt for a tumor, but you may not find one. 
And so is that going to mean that you come back in three months or four months or six months? See? So we're just not quite there. Exciting technology. We, personally, we've been doing it for 10 years, 15 years. In fact, I did a, a breast trial in patients who were doing bone marrow biopsies on them when they were under anesthesia. We did their breast surgery and looking at circulating tumor cells and trying to correlate that with risk of recurrence and other kinds of things. So, so we, we've, been, we've been on that technology for many, many years, but it's not quite ready for prime time. I hear good news uh, from you and, and the news, reading and hearing about it, about cancers like breast cancer, leukemia, colon cancer, lots of progress is being made. What are the elusive cancers that are out there and you have not figured out what to do about them? The ones that don't respond to our treatments, they're elusive. And, and you know, you know we, can, we, can look, we can look at glioblastoma and say, well, brain tumor, gee, those are more difficult to treat, or some of the leukemias and so on and so forth. But you know, I always say, this is like when we used to, I used to say, patients, well, you know, your risk of an infection is X. But for the patient, now it's used to say this for the patient, I said, you know, but that's a little consolation. The 99 other patients didn't get the infection, but in you, if you get the infection, it's 100% risk. <laughs> you see what I mean? And so, you know, the individual patient is never going to think of them is, you know, well, do I have a 1% risk or a 5% risk or something like that? 100% for them. Well, if we have one more question, there, I'm supposed to say. Oh, <laughs> really? Okay. Gene. Uh, do you do uh, joint research projects with other cancer centers? All the time. So, so we, you know, first off, as I said, we belong to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So that's 32 of the biggest cancer centers in the country. And we create all of the clinical pathways for every kind of cancer, pediatric, adult. And we have an expert from each cancer center about every kind of tumor to participate. What's the best practice algorithm? Then we have either grants or clinical trials. As you can imagine, lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, et cetera. We are good friends with people in all the big cancer centers who do research in those areas. And we share information and we share projects and they participate in our clinical trials and we participate in their clinical trials. And so there's a lot of exchange of information. And uh, could it be better? Maybe so, but, but we actually do a pretty good job of exchanging information and and getting patients to participate in the most cutting edge of the day stuff that's available. Well, thank you, Dr. Evelyn. Thank you. And thanks again, all of you, for what you do. Keep raising money because you're going to generate the future leaders of cancer research and care. And heart disease and transplantation and neuroscience, et cetera. So thank you all what you do. Is this one thing? Would you comment briefly on the involvement of the Simons and their commitment to all of this? Simons, yeah, okay. So so Al has been uh, you know a number of years, you know, he he's the guy who had the vision. We've become good, good friends over the years. A number of years ago, he happened to be in an event with me, and somebody asked if they could get a picture and said, well, geez, could you guys stand closer together? And he said, sure. He said, after all, he's my partner. And I took that as being a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> and then a few years ago, Post Dispatch called us up and asked, They've been trying to track down Al Seidman because they wanted an interview, and he refused. And yeah, he's a very private person, and he, he 
called me up and he said, Tim, you're my managing partner. You have to deal with this. <laughs> so, yeah, he actually is very engaged. He's given money to the Sutton Cancer Center. But more importantly, he loves, loves hearing about all these fantastic Star Wars kinds of things that are happening at this cancer center. And I'll share a little personal vignette. He, he, he and I have lunch frequently, and he made a comment to me at one of his lunches. And he said, you know, Tim, I've been very successful in business. But the best investment I've ever made was Sutton Cancer Center. So he did it for the right reason, and thank God he did. And you know, lending his name, in my opinion, made it easier for other people to say, oh, well, wait a minute, this, this, this organization is legit. And so that was, that was very, very important. So thank you again. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you for supporting all of us. Thank you so much for the token of our appreciation and support of our scholars. It's yeah. our new Women's Society coffee blend. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> thank you so I love much. that every morning. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And I hope to see you all at our social event on March 7th. Uh, please join us and at our next lecture. Have a great evening. Thank you.